Let me introduce you to the man who discovered Loki. <laughs> we few, we happy few are happy to have Kenneth Branagh here with us tonight. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Wow, that's a, that's a big full house. Thank you very, very much for coming, thank you. I think they liked it. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Tom Hiddleston isn't in it. Uh, he's, uh, he's currently appearing on the West End stage as Shakespeare's Coriolanus, and uh, very brilliantly too. And he gets his shirt off as well, for what it's worth. Uh, I guess there's always so much stuff I wanted to talk to you about. When, and, and one of the things I was thinking about, I mentioned to you backstage, is as I was watching this, I kind of thought of um, the spy who came in from the coal, and that kind of sort of gray feeling of lots of dark rooms and sort of like sunless skies, and you were saying that was one of the movies you watched to get ready for this. Uh, it was, it's a black and white movie uh, uh, that uh, has a is very sort of um, heavily atmospheric in the way it sort of broods on the preoccupations of the, of the central character, and uh, w one of the things I said to Chris Pine when um, we were doing this, and one of the reasons I wanted to do it, because he was already attached, and the script came to me with him attached, and I was very excited to work with him, was the uh, opportunity to, uh, to watch him thinking. In Spy, who came in from the cold, a lot of it is watching Richard Burton think and react to, uh, uh, to the, 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 the events of that particular story. So, also with Harris Zambalukos, our director of photography, um, uh, who did Thor with me and Sleuth, and he's just done Cinderella with me. Uh, the, the, we were much inspired by um, you know, early 70s uh, m movies that w w were from this country that were often sort of drained of color or, 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 or sort of slightly sort of bleached in a way um, and had that sort of gritty grain in the grain of the film quality. We shot on film mostly, and, it was, and where we shot digitally, which was to do with light conditions at night, we then um, uh, affected the film to match that sort of grainy thing, which for us was, was um, you know, inspired by, we should be so lucky, but inspired by uh, pictures like Three Days of the Condor, the Parallax View, um, you know, different, slightly different genre, a French connection, um, even, even very different genre again, but Dog Day Afternoon, that kind of uh, gr gritty kind of um, uh, early, early mid-70s American cinema. Yeah, that's that sort of feel of, because uh, what you, you really do is give um, this kind of milieu a sense of place, and, and also there's lots of blues and grays in this too, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, the, the, there was some... Um, uh, we were also tr we were trying to, you know, go for um, if there was a sort of classical DNA to the to the to the Clancy universe storytelling, where where these uh, novels were largely came from the the as it were the Cold War era, uh, we were definitely trying to go for something classical in the sense of r r facing off again the the old enemy. Uh, Russia and America, but in, 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 and, and sometimes visually trying to do that with blues and, uh, and, and the way we try to um, you know, present a little bit of color on the Russian side of it without being too sort of uh, heavy handed, but, but trying to create quite, quite striking and quite simple uh, contrasts and, and conflicts between old and new and the old empire and the new empire and the old, older man and the younger man um, and, and the, the sort of cultural, the cultural differences. Um, um, in, as far, in as far as we could express them. That sort of sense of protege mentorship that runs through stuff you do too, doesn't it? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, the, the, I, I, it's very hard sometimes to see the, necessarily the conscious connections you may have in your work. I, I like to feel as though I respond to scripts and material w with as much intuition as I can allow myself to have. Um, given that you know you also try and bring a bit of art to it, a bit of artifice. But uh, these last two or three pictures that I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to make uh, seem seem to be about a certain coming of age element, a certain kind of um, acquisition of wisdom, loss of innocence. Whether it's uh, Thor, in this case, maybe in this origin story, Jack Ryan, in a different way, Cinderella, in a, in a different form. Um, just that 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 crossover moment when uh, idealists or or, or or rougher diamonds in the case of Thor have to cross over into some form of adulthood, take some form of responsibility, whether it's Jack Ryan working out whether he wants to be in a modern CIA, what he's prepared to do 
to perhaps serve his country, uh, the compromises he may, if he sees them as compromises, be prepared to make, the lies that he may have to tell, the secrets that he may have to hold on to, um, become troubling uh, points on the journey between, you know, a, a more youthful, innocent view of the world and the one that has to accommodate some of the, you know, um, uh, kind of effects of experience. You realize you just described Henry V. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I might have mentioned to you, when I remember doing the, 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 the music recording for Thor, and I got very moved, I adored my own dad, who's, who's long been gathered, and uh, Hopkins is on the, you know, at the end of the palace with, with uh, Hemsworth, and he comes up and he says something as simple as, I'm proud of you. It always got me choked, because um, that's the kind of thing my dad said I'd be in, in, in ribbons, you know. Um, uh, and... Uh, I remember Patrick Doyle, our composer, who wrote the music for this. Uh, it's probably the 12th score he's done uh, for, for me. Um, I remember being very sort of choked by that and thinking, ah, now I know what this film's about. It's about fathers and sons, or at least that's what it seemed like at that moment. Uh, and I said to him, I, I said, do you think I always make the same film? Uh, and Because you, you just said, I just described Henry V. And I just wonder whether you keep making the same film again and again and again. So I said to him, do you, do you think you keep writing the same score? Um, and uh, and so, so there, I don't think there's any, anything necessarily wrong with that because of course obviously they're all different stories and you hope that some some originality is brought to bear but they, I guess that I suppose that there can't help but be recurrent uh, preoccupations or that, 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 that emerge. But it's that question I was asking before you know about that, that relationship sort of mentor protege father son uh, sort of also deciding uh, basically, if you're going to be an adult in some ways, which is certainly what Henry V is about, is what Jack's going through here, and coming to grips with your nature. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I guess uh, that, that, that's, that's in part true, and, and it's also trying to find a way that, I suppose, uh, that, that, that embracing um, a kind of maturity or adulthood or whatever need not mean that you give away all things that are fun or, um, you, know, you know, delightful or silly or lunatic or anarchic or whatever, you know, or all the things that are just spontaneous, you know, that kind of... Um, uh, Finding a way to negotiate the gravity that comes your way when you experience loss or you experience sacrifice or any of the things that might be part of, you know, the growing up process. How, how do you do that and somehow still still keep the child alive inside you, I think, is something that, you know, interests me. You said that, uh, that Chris Pine was on this and this has kind of been around for a while. And what sort of struck me about this as compared to maybe some of the other Jack Ryan films is that uh, Ryan here is a less passive character. I mean, because by virtue of being what he is, an analyst and an observer, he's kind of, in a lot of ways, and I forced myself to reread the book to get ready for this, uh, The Fun for October, he really is an observer rather than a reactor. And you put, in this situation here, he has to react. You, you made him a much more physical and, and, and reactive character. Well, we wanted to, um, you know, sort of reimagine um, the character, given that, that um, you know, he's had this quite, you know, remarkable impact. The character's been memorable for lots of people across lots of novels, and so you work out, well, well, why is that? Why are we still interested? Why am I interested? I was interested before I read the script. I knew the previous films. I knew some of the novels. And there's something, in a way, there's a sort of sleight of hand that, that seemed to go on, which is that a, a reactive man, a man who, in a, in, in a sort of sly way seems to be presented by Clancy as, as superficially um, sort of ordinary to the point of almost dullness it would seem. In the, in the books, you know, his, this, he sort of, he, he underlines, it seems to me anyway, sort of uh, w w what he kind of characterizes as, as a kind of um, a kind of uh, a particularly modest sort of suburban life which he, he doesn't choose to you know, necessarily um, kind of uh, uh, vitalize, if you like. But in fact, that all happens with a character who inside that has this brilliant, sharp, analytical mind, and who in a way, in the same books, actually ends up, Flaubert once said, you know, you've got to be uh, bourgeois in your private life and revolutionary in your art. And, or at least that was a healthy balance in his view. Uh, and and some, there's something about that in Jack Ryan, who, who, whose very so-called normality is somehow is, is a way of coping with this throbbing 
absorbing analytical brilliance that is his mind, which will get him into trouble, as it were, as the other elements of this so-called normality, a sense of decency, a sort of a moral life, a conscienced life, a principled but non-priggish, non-self-righteous life, will mean that when he is in a difficult situation, he'll hang on in there. For Chris um, uh, Pine, one of the, for me, one of the key notes to the performance is, is, is how he reacts when uh, Jack Ryan is, is alone in Moscow on that rooftop and he's just killed a man. And first of all, it's the attitude to death, the attitude to having killed someone, not casual, not glib, uh, you, scary beyond measure and messy and, uh, and not an ennobling thing. And now he's alone, and now he needs help, and you know there's a decision to make about what to do. And I think Chris's sort of the the the, the sort of vulnerability he brings to that is very very winning, uh, and and is part of the Jack Ryan we were trying to hook into, which is the you know the everyman good guy in the difficult situation. You hope you don't want to hope you kill someone, but you'd hope if you're in this terrible situation that maybe you could do in as much as it occurred to you, step by step, the right thing. And that, that, that sort of, that journey with him, uh, I think, is, is very well caught there. At the same time, as another key scene for me with Chris's performance is, is, in, the, um, is in the airplane on the way from Moscow, where you see this very quick thinking, quick-witted, sharp intelligence at work, uh, putting, putting stuff together. And uh, so those, those two things, the ordinary and the extraordinary, kind of coexist in Jack Ryan in a, in a way that is a, 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 a very interesting kind of chemical balance from Mr. Clancy. See, I thought for me a key scene is that scene when he walks back into the hotel room after the, the, they've come and cleaned it up, and he's just gobsmacked. I mean, he, it's just him sort of seeing what he's put himself into, and it's, there's no trace of any of the mayhem that had taken place before, and you can sort of see him asking himself that question, who am I now? Yeah, who am I? And, and uh, is this what the CIA does? This is like, you know, he was out of the room for half an hour. One of the, one of the touches that I like is just the man coming out and seeing the little tray with the three chocolates on the pillow. It's just, really? They, you know, they, you almost feel like somebody's come in and are in black clothes, but they have the three chocolates with them. It's like the, the CIA housekeepers have got their little box of... Uh, box of tricks ready. Um, and the uh, note on the bed, like, probably like, Bill, when you wake up, please dial nine for breakfast. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, that to me is a key moment in, in the way you're staging this for us to get an understanding of him. And also for me, kind of a really sort of, again, it brings him to mind, the spy coming in from the cold, that silence, that sort of having to take in what's happened yeah. and what do I do next? Yeah, I, I also, uh, I, I enjoyed their coming up with a kind of sort of Russian hotel Muzak that then, that then kind of, that sort of dies and you're left with your three chocolates, a, a newly crisply laundered room, and the large dead man removed. Um, and, and, I, and this kind of sort of tumbleweedy, alone moment in, in Moscow, you do feel for him and you, you know, what do you do? Get the, get the phone, I love you, please, somebody, somebody out there, tell me, tell me you love me back quickly, quickly. It's like a, you think at that stage, that, that's one of the things I like about him because, you know, he doesn't have the, he doesn't have the superhero cape on, he's just that guy on his own. You saw him be brave, you saw him be gutsy, you saw him be, you know. But then see when he's talking when he's talking to Kathy on the phone, he's walking the streets of Mo Moscow, his hands are shaking. I yeah. mean, there's the only trembling a little bit, but you can yeah. still see the adrenaline. I think that's because we were on the streets of Moscow and the traffic was going crazy. Uh, there's a, in uh, where we were shooting there on this bridge in Moscow, uh, in, it happens in many other places. Uh, there's a, there's, I don't know, six, seven, eight lanes, and then in the middle there's a single lane, which is for people with certain um, kinds of number plates that they've paid a great deal of money for and uh, this seems to give them license to go very 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 fast indeed but and it's two-way traffic but there's only one lane so I mean you're always it seems like a heartbeat or whether screeching and squealing of you know um, so we were doing the scene and just making sure with you know keeping an eye on that middle lane so that um, Chris Pine wasn't going to end up you know in the uh, in, in the Volga yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you're saying there was real terror. That wasn't acting when his hands were shaking. It was, we, we found, I found anyway, Moscow to be a very intense and vibrant city and, and uh, city that um, you feel the, the, the sort of energy of its, uh, its being rebuilt. There's lots of, lots of buildings going up there. The, and yet right in the center of it is this very 
dominant city that is the Kremlin, and ev everything seems to reflect it and be near it, and uh, and the the, the the sound and the intensity of the the city sounds sounds and smells and everything are very very powerful and and, and for me very uh, exotic. So it's it's you feel very very alive there, and that you have to be very front footed when you you know when you. Um, walking across bridges, talking on the phone. And, uh, um, so we, had, we were pretty careful. But I, as I think I mentioned to you backstage, as I was watching, um, especially when the movie moves to Moscow, I found myself thinking about a movie I watched a couple of days ago to prepare for this, in The, ble in the Bleak Midwinter, which has that sort of sense of, okay, Joe's got that great speech at the beginning of trying to figure out who and what he is and how he's going to proceed with his life, which is, I almost felt like that speech was kind of going through Jack's head in some way. Uh, I'd love it if Jack Ryan had watched In the Bleak Midwinter. I'd really have liked that. This is a, a, a favorite film of mine that uh, was very dear to me, um, which we made in uh, 95, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a black and white movie, and it's about a group, a group of actors trying to put on a, a production of Hamlet in a church. It's, uh, but, it's, but it's really about, I suppose, really about a guy trying to find himself and find out who he is and what, what makes, you know, he has a moment uh, of just trying to work out Literally, what makes life worth living, and, uh, and whether he can do it. Yeah, whether he can do it, and uh, I, 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 that side of Jack Ryan, the, the, the taking, the having the courage to take one step at a time um, in a very, very difficult situation. Um, even in the context of a genre that is, you know, entertaining, we hope, and um, and and kind of, um, you know, uh, we're in a, we're in a sort of mainstream world. But uh, I think the, the, uh, it's still possible for the, those sort of personal moments to tell very strongly. Well, because so many of these characters that you dramatize on screen, uh, and I even think of, of, in some weird way, Loki in Thor kind of uh, crystallizes for me as this guy who's kind of lost between his thoughts and his actions, and, and which, which side of him is the real side. Mm. I, I think uh, that, that, that uh, when it's, you know, Beautifully played, like like by Tom in in in, in those pictures. The um, uh, it's, yeah, that kind of conflict, that that inner conflict between uh, uh, yeah, a kind of intuitive, intuitive and sort of heartfelt sense of what might be right, and a sort of um, and and a, an intellectual understanding of of your desires and your temptations, and yeah. and uh, especially if you're bright enough to be amused by both, which he is, and if you have by way of an expression of that magic powers. Um, so you can play with that little dynamic, then it, it becomes a very, um, um, you know, compelling and entertaining sort of series of, of, of possibilities. But also a torture by self-awareness a bit. I mean, that, even in Peter's friends, I mean, there's that sense of, oh, they're, do they make them leap into adulthood? Um, what happens when you become an adult? Do you leave all these things behind? I mean, can you marry these two parts of your life? That's something that clearly means a lot to you. I, I guess. I mean, the. Uh, you, I mean, you're reflecting back what I, I don't necessarily consciously know is going on, but um, I. I I'm re for, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment called *The Inheritance of Loss*, which is a book set in India, Kiran Desai, and uh, to some extent, I found myself uh, drawn to that. I'm just reading for, for pleasure, and, and um, the. But the. I don't know. It seems a bit kind of sounding a bit trite saying, but the, the the loss of the wonder of of childhood and that innocence, you know, that sort of sense of that that time when life was safe, when play was fun, when parents weren't gone, when when the world had not sort of started kind of you know licking you into shape, as it were. Uh, that kind of sort of having an attitude to that that isn't just romanticized, that isn't just nostalgic, that isn't just sentimental or saccharine. I think is something maybe that people have to, um, you know, re resolve naturally. And lots of people just do because you get older and you, get, you know, you're, you're happier and, you, and things, you know, your life moves on the way it moves on. But, but uh, you know, there is, uh, we have a relationship to that, that, that kind of age of innocence that yeah. I think is reflected and probably in some of what I do. But I, I guess I just find myself thinking too often, so often these things, and I guess I'll look here in a little bit, in your character, these these guys who have a kind of a capacity for self dramatization. I mean, there are kind of there is that self awareness placed into the way they walk into a room and the way they move and the way they dress and the way, for example, he's always walking ahead of the two whoever is with him. That capacity that these guys who understand that they're bigger than life is something that kind of runs through your work too. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, certainly somebody like uh, Sheravin here was really interesting to play and try and research as well. These are uh, interesting characters, and if, um, uh, if, if you're supposed to be my age, I'm 53, and so you, that, that being the case, Victor would have lived through the Soviet era. Um, in, in our sort of backstory for him, he joined the military then, would have fought in Chechnya, would have, uh, you know, come back to a Russia post-Soviet that was being broken up, businesses were being, you know, uh, sort of, um, well, the, you know, the political and the commercial uh, world was being completely sort of re redrawn. Okay. Uh, yeah, upended and chaos reigned, and as one of the characters in this film says, you know, it can be the Wild West uh, out there, and uh, the recreation of some of those guys who were in the military and then were pretty, you know, formidable, let's call them businessmen, uh, who, 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 became, uh, who became oligarchs, this weird word oligarch, uh, where, with these untold billions sometimes, uh, and a very, very shadowy relationship to government. I mean, very, very blurry sometimes, it's hard to... And in some ways, as you said, oligarchs, they are the government in their way. Well, some would argue that, and that some would say that it's certainly an interesting, it's a parallel alongside a political system that was that went one way and now has this, you know, curious little um, hopscotch that Mr. Putin does between prime minister and president and prime minister and, you know, um, still seems to run everything. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, he, he, he himself is an absolutely fascinating figure in, in, a, in a completely changed uh, political landscape. But nevertheless, you know, someone like Sherevin also has, a, a, and as you say, partly self-consciously, um, which seemed to me part of the Russian character. I talked to friends, Russians, who, who became friends, and I'd say, well, you know, what, what, what for instance, with, with Shrein, what, is, what does a Russian do when they get, when they're very, very upset and emotional about something? When they're very upset and emotional, they go down to the river, they cry all night, they drink vodka all night. And I said, what do they do when they're very happy? They go down to the river, they drink vodka all night, they cry all night. And this is, you know, this is, the part of being R R Russian, so some would put to me, is the idea of this, this sort of intensity, this more, this more, they want more, and and a definite sense of sort of, you know, romanticism, very, and a, and a strong sense, uh, very particular sense, you know, that was so, um, you know, uh, very particular with a, 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 a regal, a royal family, all the way through to the, you know, the, 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 the revolution in, in, in 18, and then this extraordinary Soviet system, and then this yet, yet again more traumatic dismantling of that. But, but Mother Russia in that has been very distinct, and so the, um, the, the, the sense of nation, although challenged by these new scenarios, is something people want to have because it was a, uh, you know, a defining characteristic which, which beyond, frankly, for a long time, wealth and affluence was that which, which g gave a sense of identity, this unity, this coherence. So even modern oligarchs, I think, want to, uh, in my experience of researching them, have that kind of sense of, you know, destiny and relationship to the country, and again, can give them funny ideas. As you're saying all these things, though, this is also Shakespearean, just because the, those constantly shifting loyalties that are built into all of Shakespeare uh, as w the, was, uh, are, are so much a part of the texture of this, too. Is that one of the things that attracted you to this? Uh, the, I, what I did find myself drawn to was the, uh, for instance, in, in the sort of, um, uh, in the center of the plot, the idea of this interconnected financial, you know, w world where financial terror terrorism is possible, where perhaps we all have experience through uh, news reports and, and, and circumstances where, you know, small, small, apparently small events in one corner of the financial globe have a massive, uh, you know, cumulative effect around the world and, and banks and people and, and, and countries, economies and individuals lose their, their livelihoods. That seemed uh, both very scary, very credible and, and very fast. And I think not only shifting loyalties, but 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 uh, you know the kinds of people who populate the movie. Jack trying to find his way through this sort of uh, moral maze. Uh, you know, Kevin Costner's character somehow trying to supervise that and be a kind of guardian in his way, striding these two periods. And Sheravin trying to, in a way, be opportunistic with his life ticking away and and wanting a chance to do something that he f finds in his very sort of misguided uh, view, meaningful, is all in the context of a world that is moving so fast and these, uh, you know, these very scary uh, financial conundrums and possibilities being so instant that that feeling of the 
pace of events in a, in a new Jack Ryan film being very important. And it was one of the reasons we came up with a style which is you know, quite kinetic, often uh, trying to keep the audience viscerally as involved in Jack's racing heart um, because of just the, 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 the immediacy of this kind of uh, ticking, ticking clock. But uh, I, I'm not trying to be reductive here about making these links. Be reductive, please. <laughs> but, but for so many of these characters you, you, you worked on, and we say the same thing about Thor, um, the loyalties shift as there's more and more information revealed. And each of these things you've done in its way, or these things you've been attracted to, is in a way a kind of a mystery. I mean, the comedies, the, the dramas, Dead Again, which is both playful and deadly. Um, the more information we get, the scarier things are, and the, the, the loyalty shift as a result of that from act to act, in the case of Shakespeare, act to act to act to act. Mm. And, and, and I wonder, that sort of gleaning of information and it, how it sort of changes the way somebody very specifically and definitively looks at the world, where that comes from for you? Um, well, I don't really know. I, I know that... that, that uh, uh, well, specifically, for instance, the, the, the sort of theme you're talking about, I've been working on La last summer in, uh, in the UK, I played Macbeth, and I'm going to do it ag again this summer in, in New York, and there's a, there's a story of, uh, you know, what you might, it's many things, but, and, and I hope it doesn't sound too trite to say that, uh, in, uh, in, in my view, at least in the current state of knowledge, it's the story of a good man who goes to the bad. He's, he's presented her heroically. And he, in the thriller time frame of Shakespeare's play, is given very, very little time to... Uh, to think, uh, to process information. Yeah, to, to, yeah. So that, in fact, from the moment that uh, victorious Macbeth on the battlefield is the most heroic and sort of well-decorated soldier in all of Scotland, to a moment, it seems, 24 hours later, where he has murdered the king, uh, is 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 given, you know, is 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 made a virtue of, and so. Shakespeare, it seemed there, loved in a condensed way to present very briefly in a capsule way, this man is good, he is heroic, he is brave, he is kind, he has friends, he loves his wife, and in 24 hours, frankly, because someone just comes in and drops a, drops a notion in that brain, that brain that then starts to race, uh, that racing mind that can be a blessing, maybe in the, in the case of Jack Ryan, or it can be a curse, in the case of Macbeth, suddenly says, well, maybe, and what if, and I don't know, and maybe I could, and I'm just, in, well, it, you know, and suddenly, and, and then, and what he also does is the moment, the moment that that murder occurs, he is unmanned. He's completely unmanned. And of course, from that point in the play, um, Shakespeare denies Macbeth sleep. And he does this to all his tragic heroes anytime. And drives but them crazy. Drives them crazy because we know what sleep deprivation does. It's a simple enough thing. You know, it, it's a torture. It's definitely a torture. And Shakespeare puts his tragic heroes through it. And he gives them no time to think. He concentrates and makes very intense their experience. He gives the audience not too much time to think. So he's always doing the kinds of sleights of hand, frankly, that an action thriller tries to do as well. Because I was thinking about this. Uh, you're talking about that character conception, your character here seems to me like somebody who doesn't sleep and is kind of driven slightly mad because of it because he's trying to, he's living, uh, you know, uh, basically with, with time ticking away, you know, uh, and, and so as a result, he's got to push himself and as a result, he sort of speeds up the clock for everybody in, in the world around him. Mm. Uh, also, I suppose, he, Sherevin has this, um, uh, it's unusual to play someone who knows the clock is ticking. So we also we also we went into the various stages of uh, cirrhosis and, and and worked out what his pain management you know kind of routine would be. So how how painful would it be? In as much as you can ever gauge such a thing, but severe, severe, and the amount of medication needed to either control that and not be sharp, or be sharp and be in pain, be in pain and not sleep not sleep and behave as one who does not sleep um, and, and, and reorder your stimulus with the alcohol and et cetera. And that, that's an interesting thing to do. It makes him very tense. It makes, you know, uh, you, you feel the kind of, um, the, the attempt to, to, to kind of hold on uh, both to his voice. He rarely raises his voice in the, in the picture and to, to uh, 
control, to try and control, which of course he's doing, trying to do it in an ultimate way. I just wondered though, I mean, if, 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 as a kid, you read mysteries or those are something that meant something to you, just the way that information is sort of parceled out in a way that drives a story, but also forces a character again to sort of figure out who he belongs to, what side he belongs to, and who he is. Th those are things that you read as a, as a boy that somehow connected for you. I certainly, I've always liked a good page-turning thriller. I just, I, I enjoy being entertained. I'm very, very stupid when it comes to plots. I'm easily deceivable, and I, I, like, I like that. I never, never, never know who does it. I never know. I, I always... I always use, I am one of those people, I bet everybody in this audience got it before me, but if you remember a film like Sixth Sense, I got it exactly when they meant me to get it. So, and as I recall, as I recall, it's when Bruce Willis is running down the stairs and I was one of the ones who went, oh, it's like a, he's sick, oh, oh. And a, lo a lot of other people turned around, oh, you know, like they were miles ahead of me. So I'm a sucker, I'm a sucker for it. I enjoy, and I love that, I love they completely fooled me, got me. I kind of, I could have jumped up and down at the end of Usual Suspects, I was so thrilled. <laughs> oh, I was like Chaz Palmer and Terry going up and down that, oh my God, it's him, it's him, he's made it up, he's made it up, it's all the things on the wall, it's just, it's just, and I was, I'm like, I'm two hours into that movie by then, it's just, again, I feel like everybody here got it before me, that one. You were the guy who was sitting behind me screaming. Now I know who that was. That's, I was that guy. <laughs> but I mean, but that thing is obvious. I mean, it's weird because I hadn't thought about Shakespeare in those terms before until just sitting here talking with you. But information, I mean, he uses information in a, the way to, to reveal character. Mm, I mean, mm. introducing a piece of information. Yeah. And just basically by throwing this piece of information into the center of the scene, we learn who everybody is. Sure. He also usually, he really does do it at breakneck speed. Yeah. Um, and it's often, you know, in order to... Um, Shakespeare's um, time schemes are often so uh, contradictory. Uh, it's, it's as if he forgot that, you know, the thing that he planned to do that was going to happen tomorrow night has got 24 hours, and then he brings a character on who says it's already happened, and he, he, did, he doesn't mind because the character who comes on speaks so quickly uh, that, you know, you don't have a chance to think. You know, well, he must be right. We, we better do what he says. So he, he just, he, he played for moments, you know. He put things sort of, uh, you know, he, he set things in motion, but he was absolutely, you know, cavalier when it came to, consistency and, and, and logic, you know, that was, uh, it seemed that if, if emotionally the moment played, uh, I mean, I think he, he believed that if you held the audience in that moment, that he was happy for the people to argue on the way home in the car, as it were, about what was possible, but it needed, if it played in the moment, he, 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 stuck, he stuck with that. He, I, he I, went for what was dramatically effective, not always coherently logical. I guess my feeling about Shakespeare is he wanted people to argue about it as they were watching it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he want no, because if you, so many people have these different ideas about what these characters represent, and that idea is just sort of creating these moments, this thing that you want to do as an actor. You want to pull the audience into whatever psychological state you're in at the time. He wanted to create that kind of atmosphere for all the characters at once so that you're so enveloped by it, you're like screaming like you were with the usual suspects. And, and, and again, there's a sense of reveal and, and, and mystery and mystique, and I feel like that's so key to the way you, you, you think as a dramatist. Well, I, I think that w what you describe is, is all wrapped up in, in the immediacy that uh, Shakespeare has. And, uh, of course, the great you know, gift that he had was that he could do all that. He, he, he usually has characters who think faster than us, speak faster than us, and, and uh, you know, think and speak densely and poetically, as well as, uh, you know, uh, naturalistically in, in many cases, um, with something like Much Ado About Nothing. I remember playing, the, uh, playing Benedict in the theater uh, and somebody coming around afterwards and one of the you know, most pleasing uh, comments I've ever had after a show was somebody coming around complaining that we'd made some of it up. And in fact, we hadn't made any of it up. It was just that Shakespeare's uh, sort of ear for the, for the sort of, for a naturalistic phrase uh, in that play contains many that absolutely live in the, in the here and now. Um, and uh, so, so I think that just, uh, you know, he thinks, uh, Shakespeare really thinks on the line and Shakespearean acting requires to be done on the line. So you don't give the audience too much time to think and question because he, you know, he'll possibly disappoint you with the plot, but he'll never disappoint you with the emotion. And, you, I, you know, one learns a lot when it comes to doing something like this where, again, you're front-footed. You're not giving people time to think. You, you're, 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 you try and play it in, in the line, on the line, you know, and, and uh, or... Uh, as it were, in the unspoken lines, uh, w w you know, when, when Chris or Kevin or Kira are, 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 are reacting. And apropos of Shakespeare and, and this, I think, 
there's often that character who has all the information. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and you could name any number of Shakespeare pieces when that happens, but it, has, it happens here too. That person, by having all this information and choosing to sort of offer it up when he does, is the person who's sort of moving things ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was uh, a very clever Shakespeare in terms of uh, whenever he was in trouble, uh, he would always bring somebody on to say the story, though, so far. You know, he'd often uh, repeat it, frankly, in a, in a Shakespearean theater audience, if we're uh, to believe the history of it, was so rowdy, and they'd be off, you know, out and buying stuff and talking, and, you know, uh, so their attention was often taken. So, for instance, in Henry V, it's great. You get the chorus comes in at the beginning of every act and just says, in case you forgot what was going on, so, the, you know, the king is in France, and here we are, the French, the French have got far few, fewer soldiers and it's all set up and let's hope it works for Henry tomorrow is a kind of you know, bad version of what they do. But it's a very, it's a very handy, handy device. He knew his audience and I think frankly sometimes he used it possibly for his own devices. One feels with the amount of work that he appears to have put out that sometimes he would do it to reorder his own thoughts you know, and sort of just gather himself for like the last act. You know? And as you know, often for the last act, he just he goes sideways. He'd go off and do a comic scene before he was ready to go with the full weight of whatever it was, Othello's demise, or you know, the fight in Hamlet, or whatever. He'd suddenly bring on a grave digger, or he'd bring on a clown, or he'd you know, he'd go to a he'd go to a low life character and and have a good old laugh before inviting everybody to get worked up. <laughs> well, you were talking about Patrick Doyle, and I was just thinking about the way you use music in in these pieces, and it's very much used for for mood here. I mean, it's almost, it, it, that chorus you were talking about, it kind of serves as that in some, in some respects here. Well, Patrick and I, uh, we often have been accused of using too much music, particularly in Shakespeare, and somehow directing the audience too much, but it's, uh, it obviously is a, a magical thing in film for um, uh, orchestrate, literally orchestrating tone. And I mean, one of the fun things I like doing here was just the first time I think I've ever done it, uh, um, uh, which is simply to uh, you know, ask permission of uh, my uh, Paramount and Skydance family at the front to remove their own music from those logos just so we could immediately start offering in some of uh, Patrick's sort of insidious kind of Russian-influenced um, score. And, uh, uh, and in fact, we use a little, a little bit of a version of um, uh, the, his version, a sort of sampled version of a, of a, a zither, uh, which you may know from um, Third Man, which is a film that we we um, uh, we, we kind of had in our minds uh, for the sequence under under New York at the at the end. Um, and if you remember, that's the how's that tune go? The <laughs> and so, but rather better than that. It's not not played through the nose trumpet, but on a zither. Um, and. Uh, that's how, that's how some of our music sessions go. I sit with Pat Doyle. It should go a bit like... Like that, a bit like, but better and like a thriller. Uh, and, then, and then he goes away and does, does all of that, and then he comes back. <laughs> well, and on that lovely musical note, let's thank Kenneth Branagh for being here tonight. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.